Welcome back to lesson 10 of our journey through the TCPIP model. In the last lesson, we had begun our exploration of Go Back In, a reliable data transfer protocol that allows the sending unit to send more than one packet at a time rather than stop and wait, as we experienced in the protocol prior to that. Why don't we pick up where we left off? Figure 3.22 shows the operation of the Go Back In protocol for the case of a window size of four packets. Because of this window size limitation, the sender sends packets 0 through 3, but then must wait for one or more of these packets to be acknowledged before proceeding. As each successive acknowledgement is received, the window slides forward and the sender can transmit one new packet. On the receiver side, packet 2 is lost, and thus packets 3, 4, and 5 are found to be out of order and discarded. Here is our window, 0 through 8. It sent packet 0, packet 1, sent packet 2, sent packet 3, so therefore these three have been sent. Now it's waiting. It received acknowledgement 0 and sent packet 4. The sender has received an acknowledgement for packet 1, and it responds with packet 5. However, packet 2 was lost. When it sent packet 3, the receiving unit discarded it and resent the acknowledgement for packet 1. But before that acknowledgement got back, the sender had already sent packet 5, which was also discarded. So the receiving units resent acknowledgement 1 again. By this point, the timer had expired. And because it had not received an acknowledgement for packet 2, 3, 4, and 5, it resent all four of them. And after receiving all four of them, the receiving unit responded with acknowledgements for all four of them. Now this graphic doesn't really, I don't believe, describe go back in quite the way I would want to because if in fact the receiving unit received packet two, three, four, and five in a row like that, according to go back in, it should have acknowledged uh, five. And by acknowledging five, it was acknowledging two, three, and four. And perhaps that's what they meant, but just wanted to be sure that we understood that acknowledgements two, three, and four were assumed or were effectively received. The Go Back In protocol allows the sender to potentially fill the pipeline with packets, thereby avoiding the channel utilization problems we noted with stop and wait protocols. There are, however, scenarios in which Go Back In itself suffers from performance problems. When the window size and the bandwidth delay product are both large, a lot of packets can be in the pipeline. A single packet error can then cause the go back in to retransmit a large number of packets, many unnecessarily. As the probability of channel errors increases, the pipeline can become filled with these unnecessary retransmissions. As the name suggests, selective repeat protocols avoid unnecessary retransmissions by having the sender retransmit only those packets that it suspects were received in error at the receiver. This individual as needed retransmission will require that the receiver individually acknowledge correctly received packets. A window size of N will again be used to limit the number of outstanding unacknowledged packets in the pipeline. However, unlike go back in, the sender will already have received acknowledgments for some of the packets in the window. Figure 3.23 shows the sender's view of the sequence number space. The receiver will acknowledge a correctly received packet whether or not it is in order. Out of order packets are buffered until any missing packets are received, at which point a batch of packets can be delivered in order to the upper layer. It's important to note that the receiver re-acknowledges already received packets with certain sequence number below the current 
when to base. If there is no acknowledgement for a packet that has been propagated by the sender, the sender will eventually resend it, even if the packet has been, in fact, received by the host. Now you've already seen how we can look at these images, like this figure 3.23, and determine how the activity occurs. I'm not going to do this one myself. I'm going to let you take care of this one by pausing the video at some point either come back to it later and look at it or you can pause it now and look at this and analyze the activity that's taking place in A and B in this image. When data is received from above the selective repeat sender checks the next available sequence number for the packet. If the sequence number is within the sender's window the data is packetized and sent. Otherwise it is either buffered or return to the upper layer for later transmission. If an acknowledgement is received for a packet in the window, the sender marks that packet as having been received. If that acknowledged packet sequence number is equal to the number of the window base, the first packet in the window, then the window base is moved forward to the unacknowledged packet with the smallest sequence number. What that should indicate to you is that packets after the base may have been received earlier, demonstrating once again that packets are not necessarily received in order. If the window moves and there are untransmitted packets with sequence numbers that now fall within the window, these packets will be transmitted. Timers are again used to protect against lost packets. However, each packet must now have its own logical timer since only a single packet will be transmitted on timeout. On the receiver side, a packet with a sequence number indicated correctly is received. In this case, the received packet falls within the receiver's window and a selective acknowledgement packet is returned to the sender. If an earlier package was not received, this one is buffered. If this packet has a sequence number equal to the base of the receive window, then this packet and any previously buffered packets and consecutively numbered packets higher than the base are delivered to the upper layer. Remember, the goal of the transport layer is to deliver the packets to the receiver in order. And according to this scenario that I just painted for you, there was a packet that was slow getting there. And once it arrived, it was acknowledged, and it and all of the more recently received packets, acknowledged packets, in order are sent to the upper layer. The received window is then moved forward by the number of packets delivered to the upper layer. As an example, when a packet number with a sequence number of the base 2 is received, it and previously received and buffered packets 3, 4, and 5 can be delivered to the upper layer. Let's say a packet has a sequence number 1 is correctly received. In this case, the acknowledgement must be generated, even though this is the packet that the receiver has previously acknowledged. Otherwise, ignore the packet. If the receiver were not to acknowledge this packet, the sender's window would never move forward. This example illustrates an important aspect of selective repeat protocols. The sender and receiver will not always have an identical view of what has been received correctly and what is not. For selective repeat protocols, this means that the sender and receiver windows will not always coincide. Now, the, once again, you can take as much time as you need to analyze this image and see how this took place. This lack of synchronization between sender and receiver windows has important consequences when we're faced with the reality of a finite range of sequence numbers. Consider what would happen, for example, with a finite range of four packet sequence numbers, 0, 1, 2, and 3, and a window size of 3. Suppose that packets 0 and 2 are transmitted and correctly received and acknowledged at the receiver. 
At this point, the receiver's window is over the fourth, fifth, and sixth packets, which have the sequence numbers 3, 0, and 1, respectively. Now consider two scenarios. In the first scenario, shown in figure A here, the acknowledgments for the first three packets are lost, and the sender retransmits these packets. The receiver then next receives a packet with the sequence number zero, a copy of the first packet. In the second scenario, the acknowledgments for the first three packets are all delivered correctly. The sender then moves its window forward and sends the fourth, fifth, and sixth packets with sequence number three, zero, and one, respectively. The packet with sequence number three is lost but the packet with sequence number zero arrives, a packet containing new data. Now consider the receiver's viewpoint, which has a figurative curtain between the sender and the receiver, as you can see here. Since the receiver cannot see the actions taken by the sender, all the sender observes is the sequence of messages it receives from the channel and sends into the channel. As far as it is concerned, the two scenarios are identical. There is no way of distinguishing the retransmission of the first packet from the original transmission of the fifth packet. Clearly, a window size that is one less than the size of the sequence number space won't work, but how small must the window size be? A problem at the end of the chapter in your text will ask you to show that the window size must be less than or equal to half the size of the sequence number space for selective repeat protocols. At the companion website you will find an applet that animates the operation of the selective repeat protocol. You can get to it at the address shown here. That completes our discussion of reliable data transfer protocols. We've covered a lot of ground, introduced numerous mechanisms that together provides for reliable data transfer. Table 3.1 shown here and also in your book summarizes these mechanisms. Let's conclude our discussion of reliable data transfer protocols by considering one remaining assumption in our underlying channel model. Recall that we have assumed that packets cannot be reordered within the channel between the sender and receiver. This is generally a reasonable assumption when the sender and receiver are connected by a single physical wire. However, when the channel connecting the two is a network, packet reordering can occur. Consider the internet. The number of hops between a sender and receiver can be huge. This is an issue that must be carefully considered. Well, I think that was a load. So let's stop now and take a break, review our notes. And this will finish the uh, current lesson, the current unit. So go ahead and take care of any business that you may have. Take any assignments, take care of any assignments that you may have. And then when you're ready, come on back and we will start our discussion of TCP.